Today, it is our absolute pleasure to be speaking with Drs. Lynn Coick and Amy Brown Hughes. Lynn Coick is Interim Dean of Humanities and Theological Studies at Wheaton College, and Amy Hughes is Assistant Professor of Theology at Gordon College. They are the co-authors of the text that we'll be discussing today, Christian Women in the Patristic World, Their Influence, Authority, and Legacy in the 2nd through 5th Centuries. Drs. Hughes and Coick, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Hughes, your book, Christian Women in the Patristic World, Their Influence, Authority, and Legacy in the Second through Fifth Centuries, provides a fascinating uh, series of portrait women saints in the early church. Why, uh, what, what's your personal journey in coming to write this book? Yeah, so I'm, I'm often asked um, why I, in general, became a historian of, uh, historical theologian of early Christianity. And because all of this sort of one big story, but it, what it was that gripped my imagination and brought me this desire to contribute to this conversation of Christians speaking about God, because that's really the case, right? It's not just me going, ooh, neat, there's something that happened early on and I'm going to study it. Like it's a continuing conversation that Christians have been having for thousands of years. Um, for me, um, there were two things that happened. It was uh, sitting in an undergraduate class um, and learning about the second century prophetesses, uh, Priscilla and Maximilla, the famous uh, so-called Montanists. Um, and I come from the Pentecostal charismatic tradition and I hadn't really grown up with much of anything by way of church history or anything. Um, and so this was a real moment for me to be sitting in that class going, wow, there really is nothing new under the sun, and these women sound very familiar to me. Uh, so that really pricked my sort of intellectual interest that I just continued to work toward um, later in undergraduate studies and then into graduate studies. And then about 15 years later, on the cusp of my doctoral work, I was approached at my little urban church in an Aurora outside of Chicago by Sarah. She was a 20-something uh, pastor's daughter, a... Uh, a single woman who she came up to me and she said, what is my role now in the church um, as a single adult woman? I'm no longer, you know, I'm a pastor's daughter, but like, where do I fit? Um, and, and I knew Sarah really well. And her earnest question really confirmed for me that part of my journey as a theologian was to answer her question. Dr. Lynn Coick, would you please share your experience in writing this book? When I was in graduate school, I came across a woman, Julian of Norwich, who is not in our book. She's much later in the timeline. Um, but Julian of Norwich captured my imagination. She's mystic. She uh, had this revelation. And then she thought over decades about this revelation that she had from the Lord that dealt with how, um, how he forgave her sin, how she is now new in Christ. And, th and there are very wonderful images um, and evocative images in this work. So that got me interested in just looking at women theologians. Um, and, and then I started reading some of the early church, like Tertullian, for example, and he, he has some very inflammatory quotes or tweets, we might say. Um, and you know, like women are the devil's gateway and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I had on the one hand, these women's writings that were fascinating. And on the other hand, seeming like doors were slammed shut in terms of women uh, participating in the, in the church um, in any kind of uh, meaningful theological way. And so I, I, those, those ideas and, and, the, and the questions that, that they raised um, kind of um, stayed in the soil uh, and, and um, eventually took root in this project. The book opens with a portrait of Thecla. The Acts of Paul and Thecla has been widely viewed as a so-called early Christian romance novel. What's your view? Are these events that we read possibly historical? What's your view? Well, those are great questions. Thank you. The, I, I urge everyone to read The Acts of Paul and Thecla. You can get that online. It's a fascinating window into second century piety and what people were thinking about, what Christians were thinking about. I think our modern readers today would be struck by how concerned uh, the earliest Christians were about wealth, um, about 
it, um, being part of the Roman uh, preoccupation with continuing family line. Uh, so th a lot of what happens that sounds religious is actually uh, political, because political and religious were closely connected. You uh, served your gods, the pagan gods, and by that you also confirmed your allegiance with the Roman Empire. So there's a lot going on in this story. However, I don't think that the best way to understand it is as a romance novel. There were romance novels at this time. Um, we have at least five fairly well preserved, but we know there were many. Um, and, you know, the literacy rate at this time was not like what we have in the United States today. But there were enough people who were literate that could enjoy these stories and then or, or hear them read. And so the but the, these romance stories generally followed a pattern where you had this couple, maybe they were married, maybe they weren't, um, and through a series of misfortunes, they were separated, they go on these journeys, and they face all these problems, but they stay faithful to each other, they survive all of the drama that happens, and then miraculously, through various events, they get back together. Now, in, in the acts of Paul and Thecla, there is travel. You do have a woman and a man, Paul and Thecla, but you don't have romance in the way that the other novels uh, have romance. Um, and you don't have um, the kind of, there, I, I don't think there's erotic um, aspects to the acts of Paul and Thecla, although there is much embodied worship Right, so there is uh, Thecla, uh, let's say like clutches at the chains uh, and, and, and rolls in the dust uh, in Paul's prison cell. But that, and, and that's a, a very emotional, but it's emotional in a worshipful sense, not in um, a, a sexually erotic sense, the way that we think of those terms today. Um. Let's turn next to look at Perpetua and Felicitas, the two women martyrs killed in Carthage perhaps around the year 203 or so. The martyrdom of Perpetua is certainly one of the most moving accounts of martyrdom uh, in all of Christian antiquity. And motherhood and familial relation plays a key role in that story as it's told. What does Perpetua's story and her identity as a woman specifically tell us about Christian martyrdom and Christian society at this early time? Good question. Uh, and again, I'll, uh, Lynn can probably speak to this in more detail, but I'll focus on just one bit of uh, Perpetua's story and Felicitas's story. Um, the part that for me really stands out to answer your question is the part where she explains to her father who she is by pointing to a water pitcher and saying that and asking him, can this, this pitcher be anything other than what it is? Because her father just so desperately didn't want her to be a Christian because he knew what that would entail for her and for his entire family. And he looks at that water pitcher and he says, no, you know, it can't be anything else. And she says, well, I can't be anything other than what I am. A Christian. And I think this is the, in, in some ways, the core of the story of, of, of Perpetua and Felicitas, identity and agency for both of them. Um, speaking forth who they are and choosing to live into that choice, trusting that their fellow Christians would meet them there um, and that to help them with their children, to sing with them into the arena, etc. And, and trusting that God would also meet them there, helping them, uh, helping them in other ways with their children to wean or to give birth um, and giving perpetual visions that would help her process her circumstance and protect their witness in the arena. So Christian martyrdom during the first few centuries was about the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings. I think sometimes um, we, we can maybe tend to map some of our modern ex experiences of martyrdom and sort of put that back onto these early Christians. But I think it's, we really want to sort of resist doing so because martyrdom was not just, well, uh, I want to prove that what I believe is true and so therefore I'm going to die. It wasn't, it, it wasn't perceived that way. It was, it was a communal thing. It wasn't just an individual choice, it was communal. Um, and it was also something that was very definitively connected to the fellowship of sharing and the sufferings of Christ. Um, 
And they were doing that individually, yes, but they were not alone. Because <laughs> um, um, a martyr is never alone. So the church considered the martyrs precious, not because they were heroes uh, and, and withstood things, even though that was part of that story, but because they walked the Via Dolorosa with Christ. Um, the martyrs were Christ's power and weakness embodied again and again in the face of other powers. So it was a different politic, a different identity, a different kind of power. And Perpetua and Felicitas' story is about all that through the experience of women. And the church was especially moved in many ways by women martyrs because it was all the more confounding <laughs> to the Romans. Uh, the more weakness was embodied, uh, a woman who had just moved a child or had just given birth in Perpetua and Felicitas's case, the more Christ was ob more obviously embodied in their witness. Christian martyrdom, um, and, and I would say really, I, 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 we're putting the adjective Christian in here, but martyrdom really is in the second and third centuries a Christian phenomenon. Christian martyrs are mainly, were mainly raised pagan and converted to Christianity. And so their martyrdom is a declaration that they no longer follow the idolatrous pagan ways. So it's very, and, and often they are martyred because they refuse to go along with the imperial cult demands. Now, all of this is also wrapped up in family. So the, the, uh, emphasis in the Roman family, the piety, that if, if you want to think of the word piety in, in its Latin form, it was really about honoring the father of the family, making sure that family honor was absolutely at the top, and, and you just, you functioned that way. So now we come to Perpetua, again, uh, a, a text that like probably, I don't know, this, the, as long as the book of Romans or the book of 1 Corinthians, you can get it online. Again, encourage readers, uh, listeners to, to go ahead and read that. Um, but here you have Perpetua, who is claiming to be a faithful Christian, and she does the one thing that most Romans would consider absolute impiety, and that is she rejects her father's request that she give up her faith. So martyrdom at this time is, is really about saying, I am serving God and I am rejecting the vision of the good life, so to speak, that the Romans have. And instead I'm establishing another vision of what the good life is. And that means I see the church as my family. I see fellow believers as my brothers and sisters. We use that language today which is good, but we don't, I, I don't think it carries in the United States, it doesn't carry the same weight as it did in the ancient world. Secondly, I would say that for Perpetua, and also there's a, a slave woman named Felicitas who plays a big role in this story, both of these women are mothers, uh, and we don't know either of their uh, uh, fathers of, the, of their children, but both of these young mothers, the, the text talks about uh, birth in the case of Felicitas. It talks about nursing uh, in the case of Perpetua. It, it doesn't hide the fact that these women are going to their death, leaving behind young children, and or in the in case of Felicitas, a two-day-old baby girl. What the text reckons with is how family is restructured such that motherhood, while very important, is uh, reframed in light of the needs of the church and life eternal. And so the, um, in Felicitas's case, her giving birth and the, all of the physicality that happens with that is directly paralleled with Christ's own uh, giving of his life to birth us. So it's wonderful imagery. And with Perpetua, she ends up, uh, through her prayers, uh, helping her younger brother. It's uh, an involved story. You have to read the book to find out all about it. But, um, but, the, uh, but the message is that uh, I, I am a mother, and that's valued, but there's actually a, a bigger family involved, and there's eternity involved. And so that's pulled into the story. And I think that's very helpful for the American church today to think about our roles, our very important roles as parents, 
of children today, but also recognizing this bigger family that we're a part of. Thanks so much for that reply. Virginity is a prized virtue in Christian antiquity for both men and women. What was the social or spiritual significance of virginity for Christian communities in the second through fifth centuries? This is a really good and a large question. Uh, first, I would adjust the, the uh, wording of the question slightly and say that virgin, virginity was not a prized virtue. It was the virtue. Um, and for many early Christians, chastity was the virtue that ordered all of the other virtues. It was the umbrella. And especially in uh, and different, the West and the East sort of processed virginity in, in different ways. And then within the East and within the West, there were different trajectories. Um, but there was this understanding that chastity was sort of this umbrella virtue that underneath all of them, uh, uh, underneath all of that is you had all of these other uh, virtues. And if you didn't have uh, one of those other virtues, you didn't have all of them. So it sort of, re it was a bit of a reorientation of sort of the cardinal virtue idea. Um, and I also think it's really important not to map our modern renderings of virginity onto these early Christians. That's one of the biggest things that when I'm teaching this, for example, that I really try to explain quite a bit because uh, our modern understanding of virginity is that it's merely about abstaining from um, sexual intercourse. Um, but that is really not uh, the perspective in early Christianity. Of course, that was a part of it. Um, but virginity was understood as a Christological life of devotion. When you don't have the empire uh, bringing about martyrs anymore, you have to, it turns into the church sort of started to process virginity as sort of a living martyrdom. So it is about, still about the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings, but it, they also add to this sort of a, a, a real strong eschatological doctrine of living into the resurrected life to come. So virgins were considered sort of the heralds of what humanity was going to be. Well, it was prized by both men and women, and I think that's a very important point to note. But in terms of virginity, what the church was thinking about at this time uh, was our embodied experience today isn't the last word. We will actually have a raised body uh, that will be immortal. That is, it won't rot. It won't get old. <laughs> it won't have the kinds of joint pain and um, <laughs> wrinkles uh, that um, we, we endure right now, or I endure right now. Um, but, uh, but, and, and so in, in light of that, what, what is, how, how do we prepare for life in that, in that context, uh, life that will uh, have a fullness that doesn't include uh, reproduction in the way that we think it today. And so not including romance between a man and a woman the way that um, we experience today that leads to procreation. So virginity was a way for Christians to say, I, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I, I believe that life now is temporary. And so I'm not going to put all of my emphasis on having children to remember me, so children that I, uh, uh, to which I can uh, pass on my wealth, children that will, in the pagan context, say prayers for me. Instead, I'm looking to the new age. The orons, that is the iconic figure of a person at prayer in Christian antiquity, is typically portrayed as a woman. What does the orons typification as a woman tell us? The, uh, the figure of the orons, the uh, praying figure that raises their hands to the, uh, to the heavens, is a stylized figure. In the ancient world, many of the virtues the abstract virtues, the, like piety, was uh, symbolized in a female statue. And I guess perhaps what we could say today would be a nice parallel is Lady Liberty on Ellis Island. Or we symbolize justice, right? Is a woman who's blindfolded and holds scales. So we also use the female form to, uh, to express an abstract virtue. And that's 
uh, in part what was going on with these figures. It doesn't mean that actual figures didn't take on this pose when they were praying. And so what you also find is the, the imperial women, so Augustus's wife to begin with, and then on through, would be portrayed as praying in this light. And, and it, it was showing their personal piety, but it was also re-emphasizing that the imperial family is good, is, is pious, is virtuous, is honorable, uh, concordia, you know, the, the, the theme of a good marriage, all of that can be wrapped up in, in this visual. So what I find interesting is that the Christians picked up this symbol and they infused it with new meaning. The virtue, they, so it still, it, it still emphasized virtue, but now it was Christian virtue, right? And, you know, I think that's something that Christians today can kind of play with. We can look at our own culture and say, you know, what are some of the symbols we take for granted that we can use but infuse with specific Christian values that, that will be able to speak to our wider culture and, and help explain to the wider culture what we mean when we, when we talk about our Christian faith. Helena, that is the mother of Constantine the Great, is most famous for her supposed discovery of the true cross on which the Lord had been crucified. Um, and she has an enormous impact on Christian antiquity and this re-envisioning of the uh, land of Palestine as the Holy Land. Egeria too, the Spanish nun who had recorded her pilgrimage through the Holy Land near the close of the fourth century also has this enormous impact. How has the Christian imagination changed in the wake of these two women saints? Um, for Helena, uh, we explain in, in, in detail in the book how Helena's story took on quite a life of its own. Um, unlike uh, Egeria, Helena's visit to Jerusalem was not just a pilgrimage. Uh, so that's one of the differences between them because she was, as Constantine's mother, she was on enough, uh, not just sort of going to uh, visit the Holy Land and kind of have this spiritual experience. I think that's often how she's read. Uh, but she was on what we call an inner uh, principis, uh, which is an official journey. She's there sort of on behalf of the empire. And, and Constantine had been working quite some time to uh, sort of restructure the empire. And the Christianization process took a really long time. I think oftentimes when we look back on Constantine, we're like, yeah, he came into power and all of a sudden the empire was Christian. But of course that wasn't the case at all. And it wasn't until Theodosius later uh, that Christianity would become the official religion of the empire. Uh, but this process of, of uh, sort of changing the landscape, literally building new buildings that didn't have um, the pagan gods on them. So the landscape was changing even visually. When she was on this journey enacting those changes, this is when she discovers, quote unquote, uh, the true cross. And in a lot of ways, uh, like the story of Thecla, Helena's story became quite a sensation and it captured the imagination of Christians for centuries. Um, in fact, the image that's on the cover of our book is from a fresco cycle, uh, the finding uh, on the finding of the true cross um, by Piero. Um, it's uh, in a church uh, basilica, San Fresco in Arezzo, Italy. So I was there a couple of years ago um, and got to see this in person. It was quite something. Um, and this is from a piece called The Discovery and Proof of the True Cross. And so it just shows that even into the Renaissance, this had this story had such resonance, and it was so um, it, it was legendary, literally. Well, speak maybe to Agaria first. Um, she uh, she is a fascinating figure, and I discovered her in in researching for this book. She's not very well known, um, but her. Her life, uh, you use the word imagination, and I think it really does capture the imagination. Here's a woman who just starts a trek, and she just marches uh, over what now is Egypt down to St. Catherine's, which is in the Sinai, that, and at that point, you know, just starting as a monastery, and she goes up to Jerusalem. She spends an entire year in Jerusalem. This would be after uh, Helena was there, and so you've got the, 
uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre that has been established. And and Agaria goes through the whole year liturgy and tells us about what's happening. And then she travels to the east, to the edge of the Roman Empire. Then she goes up north and she's in what's now modern day Turkey, looking at a shrine, shrine of Thecla, who remains this very important figure um, throughout these centuries. Agaria knows her Bible well. She, she's excited to connect the Bible with the place where these amazing things happened. Um, and so in a sense, she takes the Bible literally. I think as evangelicals will read this today, read her uh, work today, they would be like, yeah, you know, I did that with my church. We walked, you know, the steps of Jesus. Um, so there's some connections that way. Um, she also is so curious and, and she's talking with these uh, bishops and monks um, she probably has some, some extra cash laying around, and so she has the leisure time and the, and the money to do this. She's an educated woman, and she feels responsible to her community back home, so she's writing all this down to tell them about it. Um, she's really engaged in the church. So I, you know, I wonder, her year in Jerusalem, you know, if I could say it this way, like, where, who'd she hang out with? You know, who, who did she talk with? I'd love to know those conversations. What it shows us, I think, is that women were very active, educated women who, were, who knew their Bible. They were part of the conversation in cities like Jerusalem that were very important cities. Um, and so it helps us, I think, populate the, the landscape of the early church with these women who had influence um, who who were part of the this growing this growing church that was establishing its doctrine um, and also its daily habits um, and and I think that's what our book um, is trying to is trying to accomplish is to fill out the uh, you know if we just have a black and white sketch hopefully this adds some color some technicolor uh, to the early centuries. If I can ask a uh, perhaps a mischievous question, uh, Dr. Koic, Dr. Hughes, what's up with Augustine's mom? And what I mean by that is in the confessions of St. Augustine of Hippo, we have revealed to us this extraordinarily close, perhaps even emotionally codependent relationship between Augustine and his mother, Monica. What do you see when you examine Monica's influence on Augustine the person and perhaps Augustinian theology? Yes, the uh, helicopter parent, the first helicopter parent is maybe how we would uh, talk about her. I think what, uh, what our reaction reveals is how very distant we are in, in terms of how we understand family responsibilities from the ancient world. In the United States, uh, by the time you're 18 or 20, you should be quote unquote on your own. And you should be living uh, your life that what, how we understand maturity is that you uh, make your own decisions. And often those decisions are not at all what your parents make. And we see that mark of independence as maturity. That is not how the ancients saw it. Monica was following the responsibilities that every Roman parent felt for their, for their child. Monica's just doing what moms were supposed to do at that time. She's not a helicopter parent the way that we think of it uh, today. And I think that's why uh, Augustine has such a close relationship with her. He doesn't see it as intrusive. He recognizes this is just what, what parents do. And frankly, actually around the world today, um, that setup for families is common. Um, I would say that the way that we think about it in the United States or in the, in the West is, is innovative compared to down through history and in cultures around the world today. You know, I'll say on a, on a, on a personal note, when I was researching this, I, I spend most of my time in the East. Uh, so this chapter, I, I split it between Monica and Macrina, who's Gregory of Nyssa and Basil of Caesarea's sister. Um, and I um, hadn't done a whole lot of work on Monica and diving into her story was actually one of the greatest delights of writing this book. Um, and, and I'll draw a bit from our book here. Uh, 
and in thinking about how uh, we sort of processed Augustine and Monica. So when Augustine mentions several people who either helped him in his journey back to God um, or journeyed along with him, it's very clear, as you mentioned from the Confessions, which was begun in around 397, that his mother Monica was his mainstay. And Augustine compares Monica's long-suffering tenacity and trust for his eventual conversion to Christianity, uh, to God's guardianship of his life. So his relationship with his mother was not perfect, of course. And at times he really chafed under uh, the pressure of her sometimes very sort of narrow and rigid vision for his life. Um, the different choices of, uh, for instance, of him getting married or not getting married. Uh, she was the one who really pushed for him to, uh, uh, to go to school. I mean, just these different sorts of things. And of course, there's a real um, uh, interesting discussion surrounding Augustine's father as well, who was not a Christian and sort of Monica's relationship with him and such. But I won't go into that. But uh, suffice to say, um, it was not his father that Augustine looked back on and said, oh, this person had a real strong impact on my life. It was his mother. So in remembering Monica, Augustine recognizes her voice as God's voice in the silence and as the beacon that helped guide him on his return. We meet a real force of nature in Monica where in, but in the, especially in, in the confessions though, where the Monica of whom Augustine wrote is the Monica that we know. And this Monica has been interpreted in some very interesting ways. Um, often women in more obvious positions of power, uh, like the empresses uh, that we highlight in our final chapter, uh, they're tagged with derogatory descriptors uh, such as domineering or bossy. So when they have this authority over uh, the empire, for instance. But women like Monica, who seem to exert this less official, more relational power, are often designated with anachronisms that just diminish and distort their roles. So uh, referring to, as many have in scholarship actually, to Monica as the, quote, queen of helicopter parents, um, a nag, which is actually a very common epithet that um, is used specifically against women in familial relationships to denigrate their role in people's lives, um, or even jokingly called a stalker. Um, and, and this is all in scholarship. So, and this amounts to a huge misunderstanding of Monica and Augustine, because Augustine and Monica certainly had their issues. Uh, stubbornness and bouts of drama obviously run in that family, but to, to, to belittle their relationship in such terms does a huge disservice to the text and, and what Augustine is trying to convey. So Monica is actually key to envisioning um, Augustine's landscape of his journey back to God. Without her, Augustine would not have become the Augustine that we know. One of the most fascinating things for me personally as I look at your book and study your work is the question of sources. Few of the women in Christian antiquity were authors themselves, but of course they exerted this tremendous influence on the practice of Christianity nonetheless. What did you learn through the study of women in Christian antiquity that might help us write the history of other so-called voiceless communities? Well, I think one of the things that's important to do with the voiceless is to look at material remains. And that's why we have a chapter in the, in the book on catacombs and, and trying to get at daily life. So receipts, um, material like from the, the average person's house, or often we don't have average person, but even the wealthy person, what, what were their daily lives like? Uh, what, what can we learn from letters? Um, Jerome writes a lot of letters to women. We don't have preserved their responses to him. It would be great if we did. Uh, we don't have that, but at least we can, through half the conversation, uh, imagine the other half of the conversation. Um, and so I think looking at uh, things other than treatises to discern the, the, the conversations a really good question. Uh, first, I would say that, of course, we know that no one is really voiceless. Um, the problem isn't really that marginalized or, or quote unquote voiceless groups didn't or don't speak up enough, but that there are voices and narratives that have been privileged for whatever reason um, and are perceived as really the only thing going. 
uh, early Christian women were speaking and acting and doing theology and writing and working in the Christian community, whether we see it or not. Um, and for lots of cultural reasons, their participation isn't well documented, um, but they were certainly participating. And we often, I think, confuse the absence of sources with the absence of influence. Um, and sometimes those sources aren't really absent in the first place. We, we don't really necessarily go looking for these stories. We don't really go, we don't go looking for the voiceless. Um, we don't go looking for the marginalized, really. We sort of, um, sometimes I think that we just sort of accept our preconceived idea of what, a t uh, of, of what a particular time was like and who was involved and who actually made a difference, who was important. And I've often said this, um, and, and you can tell by the shelves someone has in their office <laughs> of, of who they, they think is important in Christian history. Um, and oftentimes I'll see, you know, there's a shelf on, on theology where we'll have, right, like Luther and Bart and all these different people. And then there'll be a different shelf that is women. <laughs> uh, women and, you know, sort of other voices. And they're like literally on a different shelf. Um, so not seen as sort of connected to the development in the story of Christianity. And, and part of what we wanted to do in this book was to sort of meld those two shelves together. And I think that drawing these, uh, these voices in, even people that we can't name and saying, that person's story matters. Um, that person's story um, is, is part of my family. And I think doing that is, uh, is really important for the continuing story of Christianity moving forward. Our thanks to Drs. Lynn Coick and Amy Brown Hughes, authors of Christian Women in the Patristic World, Their Influence, Authority, and Legacy in the Second through Fifth Centuries, available from Baker Academic in 2017. Drs. Coick, Dr. Hughes, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.